Okay, perfect. I think we, we can start now. And if people join later, they're always welcome, I guess. Is that right for everyone? Yeah. So, um, yeah, perfect. So um, I welcome everyone um, to this talk from Noble. Um, he's a good friend of mine. He will talk um, on the topic of pharmaceuticals within the colonial enterprise. I'm very glad that he's here. Um, but first of all, um, some, some words about the whole event, the whole Tour de Lorraine, which this, um, this talk is part of. And also first um, the note that there is a translation um, into German uh, simultaneously translation to German. You can find it um, down there on the little globe. Um, ich mache das auch noch gerade auf Deutsch. Um, hallo zusammen, willkommen zu diesem Event. Es gibt um, eine deutsche Übersetzung, um, eine simultane Übersetzung für diesen Vortrag von Nobel. Um, ihr findet um, die Übersetzung unten im anderen Kanal, es ist so eine Weltkugel abgebildet, ähm, da steht Dolmetsch, da könnt ihr, könnt ihr den deutschen Kanal auswählen und ihr ähm, hört dann die deutsche Übersetzung, ähm, simultane Übersetzung. Genau. Um, yes, so I'll change back to English now. Um, first of all, some, some words about the Tour de Lorraine. We're a collective that we hold a some sort of um, political festival conference every year um, where we discuss different topics. Um, this year's topic is on decolonization. And usually um, we also have some sort of a, um, a night, um, solidarity night with all the bars and pubs in Bern. And um, we spend the money, the money we get there, we can, we can spend them for emancipatory, emancipatory projects. Uh, this year, it wasn't possible because of COVID um, to have this sort of um, solidarity night. So if people want to uh, donate something, um, you can do that online. We're very glad if you, that, if you do that. Um, exactly. So today's talk uh, fits in the whole two weeks program. So we had already a week of program with cultural events, with talks and so on. Um, some of it is already online um, you can watch it online and make sure you check out the coming program as well um, it goes until the 13th of may so another week um, and we have some nice um, some nice uh, program events are still on yes but um, now for for the talk uh, today, um, I'm very glad that we have this talk um, from Noble. Um, Noble uh, is the founder of uh, uh, Pirin Center of, uh, for Learning and Development Research in Ghana. He uh, studied uh, chemistry at the University of Ghana, then studied um, international relations at the Webster University, and he did study um, uh, African development at the London School of Economics. That's where I got the chance uh, to meet Noble, where we know each other from, um, uh, and where he became a good friend of mine, uh, a very wise friend. Um, was always and is always interesting to discuss um, different topics with you. Um, so I'm extremely happy that you have this talk today about your um, main field of expertise, pharmaceuticals within the colonial enterprise. So we're very, very honored to have you here and have this talk and the discussion as well. Um, we will have a, a talk by Noble first. Um, you can always um, ask questions in the chat. Uh, Luca will, will gather the questions uh, and at the end of the talk, um, you know, ask the questions to, to, to Noble, but also at the end, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, so please, if you do have questions of any sort, um, 
make sure you ask them. It's a very, very great chance um, of discussion with, with Noble and all the people uh, involved. Um, so yeah, Noble, I will give you the word. And again, I'm very happy that you are here with us um, and holding this presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nicola, for the very kind words. Um, I hope everybody can hear me very clearly. Um, yes, so like Nicola said, we met at the London School of Economics, um, where he was studying in economic history, and I was studying African development. And, you know, we've had so many interesting conversations and chat together. So I'm happy that he invited me to this conference and also to give this um, presentation. So um, I'm first of all going to go straight into my presentation, but um, I'll just take a few minutes to talk about some broad, broader topics, you know, happening around pharmaceuticals. And then I'll get into my presentation. And then at the end of the presentation, I will respond to some questions that um, uh, the audience may, may have, you know. So, um, first of all, a few words on, on activism. I think, you know, like, like Karl Marx said, um, the philosophers have interpreted the world in, in so many ways. The point now is to change it, right? Um, so what Karl Marx said. Um, and I also say that academics and scholars have also studied the world in so many ways right now. And the point now is also how we can change it. So you will find that a lot of academics and scholars now are becoming activists, you know, because we now it's not the benefit of all. Okay, so you will find that a lot of scholars and 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 professors and and researchers are taking up activism, you know, in an attempt to to make the world into a much more desirable place. Right, and one one quote that I've actually been fishing out for um, that really captures this this drive that we should all have to change the world. Um, it's actually a quote from the late um, professor of anthropology at the London School of Economics, David Graeber. You know, I, I searched so much for this quote, but I couldn't find it. But then I can summarize. I mean, he Graeber in this quote was effectively saying that. The world is how we have made it. And so that if we want to change it, we can. Like it is possible for us to change it, right? So um, we, we just have to have the political will, as people will say, or the desire or the humanity, you know, to be able to change, to change the world for, for, for everyone into a better place, right? Um, and, and so I love, I love this activism that is going on. I love the, 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 the spirit of this conference and all that is going into it. Um, staying on, on, on activism, um, I, I will start off by, by noting the activism work being done by Priti Christel. Priti Christel is a lawyer by training and you know, currently does a lot of activism in, 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 the, in the medical and patents area. You know, so she's an, she's an international lawyer who looks at international patents you know, and also studies racism and inequality within medical research. Okay, now pretty critical. Um, recently, you know, gave some presentations that I was fortunate to have listened to. And she cited two interesting case studies. One of them was around a medical device called the oximeter. Now the oximeter is, um, is simply a device that measures the concentration of oxygen in your blood, right? And and this, this, this device is actually a device that you can actually just simply purchase. And it can be like a home thermometer that you can use, you know, you, you use thermometer to check the temperature. You can use this one to check the concentration of oxygen um, in your blood. Um, what she observed is that this oximeter does not work very well or doesn't work in the same manner um, on black people as it does on, on Caucasians or white people. You know, and the disparity in the functioning of this medical device, you know, is because during the randomized control trials, when they were trying it out, a lot of black participants were not enrolled on this medical research, right? And so you don't have very good black representation, you know, 
and and that speaks to the racism that is you know inherent in in medical research and in, in participants in selecting participants to be a part of you know wider medical research so it has now become you know um, critical that in this covid times you know your oxygen concentration is is something that is very important right so now in covid times we're beginning to see that you know this device does not work in the same manner as it works you know um, on, on white people so this this is an interesting case study that she reviewed on, on the need to do better next time you know in, in, in making these you know, or in creating these medical devices another case study which she highlighted was the research funding and philanthropic funding that goes into sickle cell research versus cystic fibrosis now sickle cell sickle cell disease is, is, is predominantly a disease that affects black people. You know, so you find a lot of black people, African-Americans um, and, and people in Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, suffering a lot from sickle cell disease. And, and cystic fibrosis is predominantly disease that affects, you know, um, the white population. What she noticed is that here also, in terms of private funding and philanthropic funding into these two diseases, you will notice that cystic fibrosis get a disproportionate amount of funding, you know, as compared to sickle cell um, disease or sickle cell research, you know. And this is just one case study, you know, that shows that even with, you know, finance and, 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 and money that goes into medical research, you will find that generally diseases that affect, um, that affect white people um, get more funding, whether private funding, or philanthropic funding, and sometimes even outrageously public funding, you know, more so than diseases that affect um, black people or black or brown or darker skin people. So she, she revealed these, these disparities and, and racial inequality in, in medical research. And, you know, she's been giving very beautiful and lovely presentations over the past few months since the, the pandemic broke, you know, um, just to highlight some of these, um, um, inequality and differences. Um, for myself, I have been concerned about, you know, pharmaceuticals and predominantly medicines and drugs used, you know, to treat um, diseases, you know, I, I, and that is because um, I have my background in chemistry. So when I, when I moved into development studies, I was, I was trying to find a way to, to merge my two, the two disciplines that I'm well vested in, that is chemistry and development research. You know, so when, it, when I got around to selecting my dissertation topic, I thought it would be nice to look at um, the pharmaceutical sector and also interpret it not through the lens of chemistry, but through the lens of development studies. And I focused mainly on local production. That is because I recognize the importance of having local production you know, in, in countries. That is because um, you have to have some form of ownership right? when it comes to making drugs. You know, that way you can direct research and you can direct funding into diseases or drugs that affect you know the wider population of your country you know so um, when i took up this research i became very apparent to me that a lot of a lot of um countries in sub-saharan africa do not have any form of local production at all and and sometimes you know 100 percent they have to import all of their medicines you know from from outside and I did not think this was a sustainable um, business model. Neither does it work, you know, in the in, in the in the public health interest of the population. You know, so I started looking into some of the problems or, or what could be some of the reasons um, that that prevents countries in Sub-Saharan Africa from developing their own pharmaceutical industries. You know, domestic pharmaceutical industry so that has been my research you know over over the past few months since since I, I wrote my dissertation and after looking at what are some of the hurdles what are some of the obstacles um, whether political or economic or business that prevents um, um, sub, uh, countries in sub-saharan Africa from from starting or owning um, their own domestic pharmaceutical manufacturing industries you know and whilst doing this research, I've, I've had, you know, interesting conversations with, with other scholars before the pandemic broke out, actually, there was an interesting conversation I, have, I had with, um, with another scholar where 
um, they were interested in looking at how Africa can become a market for medicines, you know, produced in other parts of the of the global south, like China and India. You know, and it's 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 nice that you know there is that solidarity coming in from the global south where medicines from you know China and India can be marketed you know on the African continent because um, China and India have managed to be able to develop the capacity to make drugs more cheaply as compared to other parts of the world. So obviously that means um, drugs from India and China coming into Sub-Saharan Africa will be cheaper than drugs from let's say Europe or, or, or North America. You know, so that works in the interest of African countries, but there was still something here that didn't sit well with me. You know, yes, I mean, we can have cheap medicines from India and China, but we should also begin to develop the capacity to make our drugs. So I don't just view the African continent as a market for drugs developed elsewhere, but how can we in-house develop our own, you know, drugs? And, you know, we all saw what has happened during the pandemic, you know, where I mean, there have been export bans on all types of medical and pharmaceutical products, you know. So in an ideal world where we thought we could rely on each other, you know, and when things are going well, some you would think everybody likes you, right? And we will be willing to share stuff with you, you know. But when it got critical and, and when, um, I mean, it became very important that you have some of these um, medical and pharmaceutical devices, countries simply decided not to export. You know, so in Africa, we found ourselves in a very vulnerable position indeed, you know, where, you know, you could, we couldn't receive some of the vital um, medicines. And even now with the vaccines, we can all see how the vaccines have been distributed. You know, the countries in the global north are getting a disproportionate amount of the vaccine. Why? Because it was manufactured in these countries. So it has become clear that international solidarity and cooperation has been severely missing during this pandemic, right? So that we cannot, you know, rely on other countries, you know, um, for much longer. African countries have also start thinking about how we can develop domestic manufacturing in, in, in pharmaceuticals and, in, and, in, and ultimately to make our own um, vaccines, you know, so that we can be more resilient and we can be more prepared when pandemics like, you know, um, coronavirus or other pandemics in the future strike on the uh, on the continent or elsewhere so i mean that that stresses the importance of local manufacturing and i recognize the fact that it cannot be done in isolation from the international world why because or the international community why because you have you have you, you have to have some form of technology transfer you know countries in the global north have been able to develop the technical know-how and the technology to make some of you know, these very important and, and vital drugs. So there will be the need for some form of technology transfer, right? And so we would need some form of international cooperation and solidarity in the form of technology transfer. And I'll be going into some of the case studies of these technology transfer programs that have been started on the continent in, in the field of pharmaceuticals um, to see how they actually played out, right? But we will need that form of um, technology transfer and also you know, in, uh, patent waivers, as we are seeing now, you know, during this pandemic, there's a, a very lively activism campaign going around, you know, waiving patents on the coronavirus vaccine so that other countries will be able to produce it more, more cheaply and quickly, you know, but waiving patents is simply not enough. We have to have a form or a very structured program of technology transfer where, I mean, African manufacturers can actually be trained or receive some knowledge from from the um, from the global north in, in making pharmaceuticals. So all of this working towards you know bringing the world into a much more desirable um, place that that works for everyone and, and works um, to the advantage of, of both black, brown, yellow, Caucasian you know and, and everyone living on, on, on the in the world. So yeah, so that is a, just a little bit of background by way of um, what is happening during this pandemic and, and what people are talking about. So now to go to dive into my presentation, um, what I wish to talk about here is pharmaceuticals within a colonial enterprise. Um, and the reason I, I wanna look at this is because you know, colonialism, I mean, ended effect effectively um, some decades ago, but you know, we have, 
you know, the, the, the modus operandi, the forms in which it operated, you know, still creeps into various sectors and various industries, you know. And so it is important for us to, to be able to fish out some of these ways in which um, colonialism has, has morphed, you know, and is operating so that we can effectively deal with, with those problems as well. And so um, I've decided to look at pharmaceuticals through this lens, you know, and, and to see what, what we can learn and what we can do, you know, in order to, you know, decolonize, um, as the aim of this conference is to decolonize the pharmaceutical sector as well, you know, uh, in addition to decolonizing other avenues of, of, of um, research or other industries and so on. So just a little bit of background on, on, on the topic of the topic of colonialism in, in general. You know, um, so if we have the first slide, you can see here, I tried to define colonialism in a nutshell. Actually, I, I took it from Carmen Krumer's book, Towards Colonial Freedom, which is a book I, I highly recommend. So I recommend a lot of books in this presentation. Um, so feel free to um, reach out or get a copy for yourself and, and, and read them in detail. So in, in Towards Colonial Freedom, Carmen Krumer attempts to define colonialism in a nutshell. And, and, and essentially what it is, is that Africa, you know, becomes a, a place where raw materials are extracted, you know, and these raw materials are sent outside the continent to be processed into manufactured goods and, and the surplus manufactured goods are then now brought back um, onto the continent to be sold at, you know, exorbitant prices, you know. And, and you will find in Krumer's definition, um, he uses the, the, the colonies become the dumping ground, right? Um, and you can see, I, I try to change the dumping ground to markets, right? That is because um, I'm trying to capture it much more broadly. And Kuma was writing this pamphlet also from, from the spirit of activism, you know? So you can see that a lot of his language in, in this pamphlet or in this book is, is very fiery and, you know, in the spirit of activism, right? Because he was going up against, you know, the colonial enterprise, you know. So um, dumping ground could also be interpreted as, you know, markets, you know. And we have also seen that Africa has become, I mean, market for for as a, for big pharma, you know. However, it's a small market compared to, you know, the markets that exist in other parts of the world. But it is still a market for big pharma where they come into um, market and sell their drugs, you know. Um, and, and we are still in that position where we are still, you know, um, exporting raw materials. And we are still heroes of wood and, and drawers of water, like I put it, you know, still at the very rudimentary stages of, of development, you know, still exporting raw materials to other parts of, of the world. Um, manufactured goods, I say manufactured goods are important because um there's some issue, right and value add, you have either added some you know um scientific processing technique you know into making the, um, the the raw materials into something else you know so whenever there is value addition there is some form of knowledge addition you know and, and knowledge as we know you know has very um wider spillovers you know and also very um useful bits so um my Manufactured goods by inculcating that knowledge component, you know, become very important, important um, products, you know, so it means that moving from raw materials to manufactured goods, you have to have some form of knowledge to, you know, input into the product. So that makes um, manufacturing a very important aspect of, of an economy or of, of, a, of, any, of any country. Um, and so you have most of these industrial plants where the manufacturing, you know, takes place at, it, it, they are not located, you know, on, on the continent. You know, this was in the colonial days. You know, you have a lot of the industrial plants in, either in France, in Britain, in Belgium, and so on. And, and so that knowledge component and the addition of knowledge and value addition is not taking place on the continent. So we are not benefiting, or we were not benefiting from this knowledge um, um, component. That is because we're still just, you know, exporters of raw materials within this colonial enterprise. And also, I say that within the framework of pharmaceuticals, an industrial plant can also be looked at as, you know, um, or laboratories, scientific laboratories, 
can also be looked at as in industrial plants in the sense that when you have these raw materials, let's say for pharmaceuticals, you have some plants where you have you know, the ingredients to make a drug. The first stages of the processing of these plants take place in laboratories. You know, so laboratories are also sites where you have some form of um, knowledge addition. You know, uh, and so it is important that you have laboratories um, not only situated in the global north, but some laboratories also situated here so that we can benefit from that knowledge component. So within that colonial setup, you can see that you know, we still were largely you know, sitting within the raw material exporting zone and not really operating within the, the, the knowledge addition component of these products. Okay, um, Nicola, can we get the next slide now? Next slide, please, thank you. Um, so um, that is colonialism in a nutshell. Um, and here I try to also um, look at um, colonialism as was, as was de um, again defined by, by Kwame Nkrumah here. He says, colonialism therefore is a, public, is a policy by which a mother country, the colonial power binds her colonies to, to herself by political ties um, with a primary objective of, of promoting economic interests. So um, primarily Nkrumah saw colonialism through the economic lens, right? You know, as a, as a form of capitalist expansion of, of the global North, you know? So by looking at it through the economic lens, you know, it became much more imperative that we end it, you know, quickly if we wanted to develop, you know, um, um, African, um, African countries. And interestingly, Mamdani also talks about how Walter Rodney answered the question of how Europe underdeveloped Africa, you know, through the economic lens. So Walter Rodney's book, which is a book also I recommend, How Europe in the Underdeveloped Africa, it was actually his PhD thesis, which was later published into a book, you know, and he talks extensively about how, you know, economically um, we did not really benefit from colonialism has very interesting empirical case studies to show this. And also Mamdani adds to that by saying that, you know, Walter Rodney answered the question, how Europe underdeveloped Africa, but then we haven't yet also attempted to answer the question, how did Europe rule Africa, right? And so um, his book, Citizen and Subject, begins to answer the political question, you know, how did um, the colonial powers segment various African countries so that they can effectively control them politically for the purpose of extracting economic benefits. So these two books combined begin to tell you both the political component and then the economic component of, of colonialism. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this particular slide here, all I want to highlight is, you know, just to stay on the point of um, colonial, cap um, um, the cap colonial capital, not having an interest in developing, you know, the colonies, you know. Um, so um, you find that a lot of the railway lines that were constructed, you know, during um, uh, colonialism was not to the benefit of, of the colonies. It was actually to the benefit of the, of the colonial powers. So you have railway lines that led straight from the mines to the ports, you know, so that, you know, the goods are taken out of the country. You know, I mean, if you ask yourself, what is the purpose of constructing railway lines and roads, um, is it not because you probably wanted to connect the whole country so that people can easily commute, you know, transportation is easier and, and economic activity booms, right? That is, that is the reason why we may want to provide roads and railway lines. But that was not the case during colonialism. The railway lines and roads that were being constructed led straight from the mines to the ports or from the, the where you have the raw materials to the port. It has no interest at all in, in, in enhancing the total development of, of, the, of the country. So here we can see that, you know, that external orientation of colonialism, where the activities that really matter, the knowledge addition component, they were not taking place on the continent. You know? So I'm going to try to tie in all of this you know, to how it talks about pharmaceuticals in the, in the, in the subsequent slides. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, you, have, you have the absence of manufacturing capabilities you know, on the continent. And that is also partly because 
colonialism did not encourage you know, um, the building of manufacturing plants or factories or development of manufacturing capabilities on the continent. You know? So we have some of this lag because of colonialism, because during the colonial era, you know, there wasn't this encouragement for, for manufacturing plants and manufacturing capabilities on the continent. I mean, all the, the colonies served was markets for these uh, manufactured goods. You know, so Atul Kohli, in his book, State Directed Development, talks about the fact that Africa went to colonialism with a hole and came out with a hole. That is, we went in with a very rudimentary um, instrument, that is the hole, you know, very mechanical, you know, used in, in, in agriculture and came out with the same device. You know, we, we, there wasn't any improvement at all. So that is just to capture the fact that even within the realm of agricultural development, you know, we didn't see much, you know, as compared to, for example, India, where you have, you know, some form of um, development projects taking place, you know, so that that retardation that happened during colonialism still lingers on today, you know, and, and the lack of, you know, industries in Africa on enhancement of domestic um, manufacturing capabilities, you know, hinders development. So you will find that that was the major drive for a lot of the um, post-colonial leaders, you know, in an attempt to, uh, for, to, to bring about some form of structural transformation, a lot of them were concerned about how can we build our own industries? How can we build our own um, um, factories and, and develop these manufacturing capabilities? And, and it's interesting because you, I mean, this was the era in which we, we had our, our first you know, um, pharmaceutical manufacturing plant, um, which was constructed with the assistance of Hungarian technology and technical assistance. And that was because during the 1970s, Nkrumah you know, leaned a lot more towards the East you know, for, for obvious reasons, because his ideology was much more in line with them. And so um, it was during this period of structural transformation immediately after colonialism that a lot of countries, including Ghana, decided to you know, develop some domestic manufacturing capabilities. Um, and, and that is important because like Hajun Chan talks about, you know, manufacturing is the learning center of an economy, you know, like I said, that is where the knowledge component, you know, is added. So if you have a vibrant and, and thriving manufacturing sector, you know, it has it has multiple spillovers in the economy, you know, because it is it is really the learning center, right, of, of an economy. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so, um, so here again, I, I wanted to also now we, we, we're getting closer to talking about pharmaceuticals and, you know, at the, at the foundation of pharmaceuticals is, is, a, is a lot of scientific activity, right? So before you can, you can manufacture a drug, there's a lot of um, scientific knowledge must go into it, you know, and, and this type of scientific knowledge um, is, is developed, you know, in our, in our universities and in our research, research labs. You, you cannot make drugs without having a very strong um, scientific backbone. And just to highlight an important paper uh, written in the 1990s by Pauline Kuntonji, who is um, um, a philosopher from Benin, you know, and in this paper, he talks about scientific dependence in Africa, right? And, and what he means by scientific dependence in Africa is because he, he looks at the scientific process in three stages. The first stage where you collect the data, you know, the data collection, and then an intermediate stage where you process the data. Here you apply, you know, some theories and some, some form of um, analytical reasoning and deductive thinking, you know, so there is that processing stage, all right, that intermediate stage of processing the raw data. And then the final stage being where you find some practical you know, uses, you know, for, for this type of knowledge, right? So these three stages, collecting data, processing data, and finally um, applying knowledge from, from um, the, your findings, you know, to, to, to solve some practical problem. What Pauline Putonji realized is that you have, in Africa still, we are still, so you can, you can compare these three stages to the three stages I spoke about, where you have raw materials, manufacturing, and markets. Right, so the raw materials being the first stage, data and factoring stage 
similar to where the intermediate research, where you actually add some knowledge. And then the final stage, that is a practical application, similar, to, right, where you come to sell the goods. So you can see in this space, the intermediate where it is not taking continent. The continent still serves at, as a site for the collection of data and then as a site for the practical application, sometimes very minimal, you know, of, of the scientific findings, right? So we are still hemmed in within the same colonial structure, right? The same colonial structure is playing out in scientific research as well, where the intermediate stage, the processing stage, similar to the manufacturing stage, right? They are not taking place on the continent and we still are hewers of wood or exporters of raw materials or a site where we simply collect data, right? And then we skip to the final stage where they are, we ever serve as markets for these products or where some limited application of this scientific knowledge takes place, right? So this setup also, you know, um, highlights what we are talking about. So he says that under these conditions, it becomes evident that the one essential shortcoming of scientific activity in the colonies was the lack of this intermediate stage of its central operation, operation of theorization. So Kuntonji realizes that missing component, right? The intermediate stage of processing is missing. So the same thing you have in Africa where you have a lot of the plants, a lot of the plants that are used you know, in pharmaceutical research, some of the plants come from the global south. Some of the plants come from Africa, but these plants are taken outside the country and the processing stage, the identification of the APIs, the active pharmaceutical ingredient, the identification of, of the important components of these plants and the processing of the plants into medicines do not take place on the continent. And after these medicines have been made in Western laboratories and Western factories, they are now sold back to us you know, at exorbitant prices, okay? So what we have here is that we are still serving as markets for these drugs and as sites where raw materials, you know, are collected um, rather than sites where we have the actual um, processing. So the question is, why is this happening? Okay, and we'll, we'll, be, we'll be looking at that, you know, as we go on. Next slide, please. So then um, he continues. So Pauline Hutonji talks about, um, I, Permit me to read to read this particular quote um, in full. It says we 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 only used to have the first and third stage, like I said, you know, the data collection stage, which takes place on the continent, and then you know a partial or occasional or limited application of the results obtained from metropolitan research, you know, was made to local issues. So you will find that you know even when they collect the data or they collect these important raw materials you know, or information, even in, in, in deciding how to process it, the end goal, I mean, is really not African countries, right? So you have a lot of medical research, you know, tailored towards the needs of, you know, a, a different population, as opposed to the population that probably supply the raw materials to start with, you know? Um, and, and that is because the colonies itself lacked laboratories and other facilities necessary for basic research. So just like I said, the missing component were the factories. And again, in the scientific process, the missing component are the laboratories, right? So we did not have a lot of these laboratories to carry out basic research. And here I'll highlight a very important paper that was written by um, Abina Osio Asari, um, a Ghanaian scholar currently teaching at the University of Texas. You know, the paper is called Scientific Equity, Experiments in Laboratory Education in Ghana. And here again, in Kuma, features strongly because what we realized, just like I said, when colonialism ended or colonization ended, there was that drive to structurally transform the economy by building factories and manufacturing plants. And we saw a lot of that during Nkrumah's time. Also, Nkrumah saw the need to build laboratories, right? Because he recognized that also within the scientific paradigm, we were still lacking in that intermediate stage. So Nkrumah started importing laboratory equipment and building what we call the science centers in secondary schools, you know? And so imported beakers, benzene banners, and all kinds of you know, scientific equipment so that we can carry out 
you know, scientific experiments and basic research on the continent. Now, when I read this paper, I was touched because what happened before colonization ended was that um, British education policy was just tailored to us, I mean, giving the indigenes some vocational training knowledge, you know, so that we were not studying physics, we were not studying chemistry, you know, we're not studying biology, just like, you know, younger people in Britain or France were studying, you know. So, but for Nkrumah recognizing this setup within the colonial enterprise, I probably wouldn't have benefited from my, from my chemistry education, you know. So it was because of his policies, his policy to transform the curriculum and to bring in the study of physics and chemistry and mathematics and biology, you know, in the similar manner so that we can catch up with the rest of the world, you know? And so that is why Osiris Sari calls this paper scientific equity, you know, because we, we have to have that, that sort of knowledge as well, where we are introduced to the very important theories in scientific research. So it's a paper I highly recommend. And that is because you have this situation where Nkrumah was beginning to address, you know, that missing component, the lack of laboratories. And he started from secondary schools, you know, but he did not end there. You know, he started all kinds of um, research institutions um, on, in, in Ghana. Next slide, please. Okay, good. So now we are zeroing in um, on pharmaceuticals. So you, you now see what the whole setup is, you know, where you have, you have very limited, you know, scientific um, um, info and processing of data and manufacturing plants on the continent. So that brings us to the point where we do not have the scientific know-how, we do not have some of this manufacturing plant to be able to make our, our own drugs. And so we therefore now serve as markets, you know, for drugs, you know, for big pharma. So you have one of the drugs that I will be highlighting in, in, in this um, presentation is Coatem, you know, um, which is um, a, an anti-malarial drug that is um, made by um, Novartis. Um, it's a Swiss pharmaceutical firm. It's a very expensive, it's one of the most expensive anti-malarials on the Ghanaian market. And every time I get malaria and I have to buy this drug, uh, I'm always angry because it's too expensive, right? And, and the question I always ask myself is that, I mean, what about other, you know, um, people who cannot afford it? You know, what would they do? So it, it's been proven to be one of the most um, effective drugs in treating, um, anti, and, um, in treating malaria. And, and and it became very important because um, you have a situation whereby um, uh, the WHO um, endorsed um, combination therapy, artemisinin combination therapy. The treatment of malaria because against monotherapies is um, based um, drugs and artemisinin is actually um, uh, derived, derived from a plant which is found predominantly in, in China. You know, so here again, you have, you have a plant that comes from the global south, but then the making of the, of the, of the um, drug from this plant was actually carried out using Swiss technology and, and with, a, with a collaboration between um, some Chinese factories and, and the Swiss to make, to make this drug. So you have um, Coatem being um, the drug, um, one, one, the Africa 7 as one of the markets for, for Coatem um, for, for, from Novartis. And also you have um, the international community creating a guaranteed and ready market in through programs like the Global Fund for drugs like HIV, tuberculosis, you know, uh, and malaria, you know, so, so so you have this um, 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 procurement from, from WHO, procurement companies in the global north know that when they venture into making um, HIV drugs, tuberculosis drugs, or malaria drugs, there is ready market for that. You know, and there is ready market for that. So they would, they would readily go into it because they can sell to the donor community um, to, be, to, be, to be sold there, then afterwards on, on the African continent. Um, and also you have here some minimal support going for the development of, of um, neglected tropical diseases, right? So neglected tropical diseases, these are diseases that predominantly affect 
um, folks in the in the global south and South Sudan Africa. Um, the reason why big pharma they are called neglected tropical diseases because the market for for these drugs is very small. You know, it only affects a very small population, predominantly um, poor people living in Sub Saharan Africa. So usually you find that pharmaceutical researchers or pharmaceutical, in the pharmaceutical industry is not interested in making this drug because you know the market for it doesn't exist. You know, but immediately um, uh, an organization like the WHO, you know, or, or some other donor agency decides to provide the market for for this drug, they immediately um, go go into it. And, and one drug that I would like to highlight here is um, eflonithine. Um, this is a drug that is used to treat sleeping sickness. You know, um, it was developed by Aventis, which is now Sanofi. Right? It's a, one of the huge pharmaceutical plants. Um, Sanofi is a French pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing um, company. And, and when they discovered this drug in, in, in 1999, you know, for treating um, sleeping sickness, you know, um, yeah, the, the, the market for it was, was small. And of course the poor people couldn't afford it, right? So, so what happened was that they, they, abandoned, they abandoned the entire project, you know? Um, so they, they didn't care, right? Whether, you know, the people who were suffering from sleeping sickness, which is a very, a very debilitating disease, you know, uh, they didn't care whether they were getting drugs, drugs or not. I mean, I could say they didn't care because I mean the market didn't exist. So there was they were they were simply abandoning the production of, of diplomacy, you know, until here, you know, stepping with South decided to to not them to stay, you know, and so uh, the medicine some people really nudge WHO to to prevent um to prevent um this pharmaceutical company from from leaving you know the production of this drug. So the WHO intervened, right? The WHO intervened, and and what Aventis said at the time was that well, what we can do is that we are going to guarantee the production for the next ten years or five years or so, um, um and then we'll supply drugs, you know within this period. But within this period as well, um, we will find a way of transferring technology for the making of this drug to other, other countries or, or other factories because it wasn't profitable for them. So they were looking for you know, a different company, preferably in the global south, you know, that can make this drug so that they can take it off their research, right? So they were prepared to do some form of technology transfer. You know, and they did find um, some two companies, you know, willing to to absorb this technology. But something interesting happened. You know, um, along the line, it was discovered that this particular drug was also effective in hair removal, right? So when you have excess hair growth, facial hair growth, especially in women, you know, it was realized that this drug was effective in clearing, you know, facial hair, right? And you know, facial hair is a problem amongst you know um, affluent white women. You know, so affluent white women um, became a market for this drug. So immediately they recognized that okay, now there is a new market for this drug in the form of you know demand for this drug to get rid of facial hair. You know, especially within a population that was relatively richer. Which is the um, white white women? They then simply went into making the drug again, right? So um, Aventis came back into making the drug not because they wanted to cure sleep in in the, in the developing world. Right? You know, and it was was richer population. You know, so that should tell you. You know, so but I mean, we the, this drug continue to be made, not out of a public health concern, but purely by because of a pro profit, profit motive. And, and that is what we still see today, you know, that a lot of these drugs being produced by big pharma really does not, you know, chime with public health needs or public health concerns, but it's, it's heavily driven by, by profit. Right. So next slide, please. Um, so you have you have that situation 
where market is what is driving um, research. Now, just to zero in a, bit, a little bit more on, on this um, Novartis Quartan um, case study. So like I said, at a listening-based combination therapy as was adopted by WHO as the first line of treatment for uncomplicated malaria, you know, using Atenita lumifantri, right? And, and so uh, what, what is interesting is that when, when this shift happened, a lot of pharmaceutical manufacturers in South Africa could not make this, you know, produce atomital manufacturing. You know, we couldn't produce this combination therapy, you know. And so immediately we lost the, ma the malaria market. Local manufacturers lost the malaria market. Now, mind you, before this drug was adopted by WHO, the predominant drug was chloroquine, right? And so chloroquine is, is one drug where local manufacturers Factors were able to develop the capacity to make, you know. So when this in the in public policy, um, we immediately lost the market. So the market now became, you know, um, open open to big pharma, right? So local manufacturers lost lost this market completely, you know. And, and according to us, is the, the policy of metal and refinery messed up, highlighted in in Nitsan Korev's book, um, Give or Take. You know, give and take, uh, which was written in, in 2020. You know, so under the new treatment guidelines, only, the only eligible ACT initially was coatin, right, which was produced by the Swiss, the Swiss pharmaceutical company Novartis. You know, so again, uh, this this became a big market for Novartis because now they are the only company with with the, with the capacity to make this drug. You know, at least one one local manufacturer um, blamed Novartis for this decision. Actually. You know, because that came um, with their muscle, you know, drug novice is a huge force you confirm and they can influence um, public policy. So you have these some of these local manufacturers blaming novices for, for being behind, you know, probably lobbying for the WHO to shift, you know, to to the to selecting this drug. I mean, I mean that that could you could see that probably comes uh, of some bitter sentiment, but you know, at the core of it, scientifically, the combination therapy is much more suited to treating malaria. You know, so yeah, but you can see what what the shakeup it caused in the local industry um, for for treating malaria. Um, so so you have here next slide, please, Nicola. Yes, thank you. Um, so so you have here. The same situation happened in Ghana as well, and with this was also highlighted by Jessica Kuras um, in, in her um, PhD thesis, um, which is published um, in, in the form of a paper now. Um, the same situation happened in Ghana where, you know, the local manufacturers couldn't make this new ACT formulation, um, the ACT um, treatment drugs, you know, so they also lost the market, and uh, they lost the market. So, um, what, what do you think would have happened, you know, and uh, like I said, you can find the full case study in Give and Take by, by Nitsan Kora, you know, which is a very interesting book. Um, what, what you would you, you would have thought would happen is that you should have some form of technology transfer, right? You know, recognizing that this is, a, a, I mean, a very widespread endemic disease on the continent, you know, you would expect that you know, Novartis will transfer some technology, you know, to um, some technology to local manufacturers on the continent so that they will be able to take up the production of this drug, you know, but I can tell you for a fact that, you know, um, the, the capacity and the capability to make these um, ACT treatment drugs was independently um, de developed by these local manufacturers. You know, they, they took their own initiative to invest into, you know, developing this capacity. And, and so for me, that is, again, part of the problem where you, you have the African countries only serving as a market. But then when it comes to the point where they have to transfer technology to us so that we can actually take up the production of these drugs, it's not happening. It, it's not happening. You know, so it didn't, ha it hasn't happened within the realm of, um, of, of antimalarial um, treatment drugs. Um, and so again, staying on the on the subject of um, lack of technology transfer. So um, uh, there was there was some one interesting technology transfer case study, which is highlighted in in Nitsan Nitsan Korev's book, you know, which is taken up by um, Russia, which is also a Swiss 
um, pharmaceutical company. You know, they launched this AIDS technology transfer initiative, right? Offering local manufacturers in developing countries a voluntary license for a second line, you know, ARV, um, antiretroviral um, drug, um, um, Sapinave. Now, um, uh, about 41 companies from 16, 17 countries express interest in producing this drug, right? Um, and next slide, please. And, and what, what happened is that, you know, at the end, um, the project didn't yield its, its, its results, right? I mean, yeah, I, I, it, it was an interesting project, you know, where we can actually study, you know, um, the, this technology transfer, you know, happening on, on the continent. But, you know, um, as, as the Kenyan companies that took part um, in, this, in this project, Cosmos, Universal, and Regal, you know, um, it was judged, you know, as a field, field experiment, you know, and one Kenyan manufacturer said it was just a piece of paper, nothing came out of it, right? Nothing came out of it, you know? And so that, that also highlights, you know, the predicament we are in right now where these technology transfer programs that is aimed to empower, you know, local manufacturers actually um, does not take place, you know, does not take place, you know? Um, um, so one, one manufacturer also said, we didn't get any major training, maybe one visit or something, right? And this is an actual quote, you know, they didn't get any major training, you know, so, so that technology transfer, it's not, it's not happening. It's not happening. So the, the manufacturing capabilities are not being um, built on the, on the continent. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, so what does this call for? This calls for some form of, I mean, policy activism, right? It calls for some policy activism where we can begin to nudge companies um, from the global north, you know, to, to establish manufacturing plants, you know. I mean, I'm taking up part of this in Ghana, you know, and, and, and encourage them to build manufacturing plants on the continent or encourage them to transfer technology, you know, um, to, to local manufacturers so that we are not just a market for these drugs, you know, so that when there is some um, global health emergency or some epidemic, we can take up our own initiative and, and make our own drugs, you know. And also we have realized that you know, really, big pharma does not care about diseases in the developing world, you know. The evidence for this, you know, is clearly shown in neglected tropical diseases, you know, and some other diseases that affect uh, poor people in the developing world, they really don't care, right? So. Um, if we are to take up the responsibility to make the drugs, you know, for these for these diseases, you know, we will need some form of technology transfer. We need some sort of support, you know, from from the from developed countries, you know. Um, and, and and now we've seen during this pandemic, right, that you know, Europe is the main site for the vaccine development, right, because that is where you find, you know, all of the laboratories and and the engineering and know how to make these vaccines, you know. Um, so I'm just going to end um, with an interesting video, which Nicola is going to play, um, which, is, which is about a drug called um, Pexinidazole. You know, it's a drug that is used to treat um, sleeping sickness, just for you to see what went into making this drug, right? What went into making this drug, you know, and, and also sort of summarizes very nicely what, what we've heard in this presentation. And then... I'll come back and you know um, recommend two more books, and then I will open the floor for questions. Um, yeah, so Nicola, take it away. The volume is the volume coming. I hope everyone can hear the volume. Quelqu'un qui devient fou. Yeah, Nicola, can you then start from the beginning? Yeah. Oh, 
Le cauchemar de tout docteur, c'est de tuer son patient. La maladie du sommeil, ça fait peur. Parce que la maladie du sommeil, vous voyez ces signes d'agressivité. Vous avez des signes de quelqu'un qui devient fou. La maladie du sommeil ou la trypanosomiase humaine africaine, c'est une maladie infectieuse parasitaire parce qu'elle est transmise par la mouche de cette cellule. The fly injects a parasite that circulates, goes into the blood, the lymph nodes, and later on will go in the central nervous system. And then eventually, if they don't have treatment, they will fall into a coma and die. The last decades of the 20th century have been very productive in terms of new treatment, but nothing happened for those very decades. Personally, when I was working with a MSF uh, during the 80s, 90s, I was confronted with a situation that was particularly dramatic because the only treatment available to treat uh, the illness was mersopol, an arsenic derivative, killing one out of 20 of patients because of toxicity. It was described by patients as fire in the veins. In my prayer, I said, God, there is no way to clear these researchers pour qu'ils trouvent un médicament facile à prendre pour soigner ces gens qui meurent. Ne fait-ce qu'en comprimer. Le premier step a été d'améliorer cette situation avec une combinaison de nifertimox et nifronitine, appelée NECT. Donc, c'est so NECT. Et tout ça, c'est pour une personne. Le NECT est un bon médicament et très efficace et qui guérit le patient. Mais c'est la logistique qui est lourde parce que c'est fait, il faut transporter ces cartons et l'amener dans le milieu où il y a des malades. Souvent, ils sont dans des forêts, ils sont dans des villages. Ce uh, traitement est disponible seulement pour la seconde stage de la maladie. Donc, vous devez passer par une très difficile et painful lumbar puncture que chaque patient doit to, to être confronté avec. Ceux qui viennent à l'hôpital, on est obligé de les garder parce qu'on doit contrôler la perfusion. C'est doit se donner en intraveineuse. Et la conséquence, c'est que nous voulons avoir un normal traitement pour traiter toutes les stages de la maladie. Donc, nous avons commencé notre recherche sur ce domaine avec la base que uh, une classe de drogues, un nitromidazole, a eu uh, un effet sur ce genre de parasite. Donc, nous avons organize a data mining of all the, the different compounds of nitromidazole coming from uh, university, coming from pharmaceutical company. One presented uh, the characteristic of, of, of what we were looking uh, for, a molecule that was called fexinidazole, and it was developed during the 80s and abandoned because of lack of interest of developing a product for parasitology. Sanofi had the molecule, but we partnered with DNDI, who brought the experience from preclinical research and being able to do the clinical trials in these very difficult to reach areas. We started the study in 2012 in DRC and Central African Republic. It was incredible to have to think about how you would do sophisticated clinical research in an unsophisticated setting. La FDC est un grand pays et la logistique elle est lourde. There was poor infrastructure, lack of scientific lab equipment. No one trained on doing clinical research and the political instability in these regions. To overcome these challenges, we had to bring electricity. We had to bring microscopes. We also brought some technology like internet and satellites to make sure we would have the connection. We did training of 200 people in good clinical practice, in pharmacovigilance, to make sure that they could comply with what is needed to have a new drug registered according to international standards.
we supported the national programs with cars, with boats, to go and look for patients. We work with the best teams, those that know how to diagnose these patients. Those that are treating these patients. Banana Bela Key, Nakomaki Makais, Nalamba, Nakinda Zamba, Nalamba, you throw a pinna banana to Zabu, Tatailo, Kimakais, and so. Patients can be treated much closer to where they live. The confiance of patients, it's a bien. We're on the path to elimination of sleeping sickness. It's not utopia anymore to be able to do this incredible research in these incredible conditions. If we bring the right partner together, we can achieve the best science for a very neglected population. Le fixer d'abord et le ranger mon rêve. C'est merveilleux. C'est merveilleux. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Nicola. So, um, yeah, thank you. Can we go back to the slides? Please. Yes, I'll do that, I'll do that. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, just like we heard from well, the three interesting statements that stand out in this presentation, in this um, short documentary for me, you realize that one of the um, interviewees said, this molecule was, this drug was abandoned for lack of interest, right? You know, Sanofi abandoned this molecule, which has been sitting on their database for a long time for lack of interest, right? And another interviewee also said, lack of scientific laboratory, you know, in, in, in these, regions and, and something that I also highlighted, you know, the fact that we don't have that scientific capability, you know, on, on the content. And then the concluding statement from one of them is that if we bring the best partners together, we can achieve the best science. And it's something that I also highlighted, that is the technology transfer, that is the collaboration that we need to make this happen. Okay. Um, so um, that that is uh, that is the case study for, for sleeping sickness. You can see how cumbersome it was before to treat the disease and how simple it became by simply taking a pill, you know, because that, that collaboration, that, that um, cooperation to bring about, you know, an effective treatment was there, yeah, you know. So, Nicola, la next slide, please. Yeah, so I'll just end by recommending two more books, you know, one by Helen Tilly titled Africa's a Living Laboratory, um, it's a very interesting book. Um, uh, Helen Tilly talks about um, scientific research, you know, and other forms of research on the on the on the continent during colonialism through the lens of history and anthropology. You know, so it's very rich. It's a very rich book in in terms of history and anthropology, and you will find some of these examples um, in there when she begins to talk about botany and and other forms of um, plant research that, that was taking place during the colonial days. So I highly recommend Africa's a Living Laboratory um, by Helen Tilly, um, who is currently a professor at the University of Northeastern in the US. And then obviously also a book that I really love um, is called Bitter, Bitter Roots by Abna um, Dov Osio Asari. Um, and this is also a book about the search for healing plants in Africa. Um, very, very, very nicely written book. Um, like I said, Osio Asari is the same scholar who wrote um, scientific equity, the paper I highlighted um, in, the, in my presentation. Um, she has also written the same book, Beta Roots, um, which I highly recommend. So these books will give you more, much more insight and understanding into what is happening within 
you know, the pharmaceutical setup um, and, and how Africa fits in. Last slide, please. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. And I think I'll now, we can now open the floor for some questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Noble, for, for your very insightful talk. Um, it was extremely interesting. Thanks, thanks a lot. It was very, very interesting and touched upon a lot of um, very important topics, uh, I think, especially relevant for, for Switzerland, as you touched upon Novartis and Roche. Um, so thank you very much. I will give the word to Luca then, because maybe there are already some um, questions in the chat. Also, if you have more questions, please just, you know, ask the questions. Um, and uh, yeah, Noble will try his best to answer them. Also, you know, difficult ones, no worries. Um, yeah, Luca, do we have already um, questions in, in, in the chat? Yes, we have. So I'll start chronologically. Well, there was a first question. Um, if we could see the second slide again of the presentation, that was a question from Joshua. And so Nicola, maybe you could show the second slide again. And I'll, Joshua, do, I'll do. If you have any question about that slide, uh, feel free to ask it while we see it. Just waiting for Nicola. Joshua, is, is it that one that you wanted to see? Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, thank you. Perfect. So I'll just give everyone a second to read that again. And Joshua, if there's any question about the slide, feel free to ask. So I would have another another question as well that concerns the slide um, that is titled with Novartis and Coat Term. That was a bit further. Yes. So the question there is it's a question of understanding. How did it happen that uh, that this this AL got the got the drug of choice for for treating malaria. What what was the step? What is the the change that you mentioned in in this slide? Ah, okay, good. Um, so like I said, um, the combination therapy scientifically, you know, artemisinin based drugs was found to be more effective against the malaria parasite. Mm -hmm. You know, so previously it was chloroquine that was being used and the malaria parasite started developing resistance against you know, this drug, right? So artemisinin was found to be much more effective, right? So scientifically, artemisinin-based drugs are much more effective than chloroquine and chloroquine has been completely phased out now, right? So scientifically, there is that you know, aspect that is much more effective. But also what, um, what, agree, what, what is happening is that there's also that political component, right? where you have lobbying from pharmaceutical companies taking place, right? So probably when this was, I mean, observed, some lobbying by the big firms, you know, into making this a global policy, right, was, was what, what happened, you know? So this is what the um, local manufacturers in Kenya were complaining about, that probably, you know, yes, it's been found to be effective, you know, but there was probably some lobbying also that took place that, that warranted that it be changed you know, uh, immediately. So there is that to the two components, the scientific component and also some form of lobbying that happened you know, at, at, the, at the international level. So yeah, and, and you will find what is interesting to note here also is that, um, and which is another book, um, I didn't have the time to talk about that book here, but it's about the list of essential medicines. So the WHO has a list of essential medicines 
that is that they use to treat, you know, I mean, a list of very specialized and specific drugs that are considered of global public health importance, you know. And there's a lot of politics goes into creating this list, right? Because if your compound or your drug is on this list, you can immediately see the market it opens up for you, right? So at that stage, also aside, if there are two drugs, you know, one being made by, let's say, a, co a company in Sub-Saharan Africa, another being made by one of the big pharmaceutical companies in the global north, you know, how do we decide which one gets on the list, right? Apart from quality considerations and all of that, there will be some very strong lobbying, right? That would influence how this list will be created, you know? So there is that political component that goes into creating some of these um, medical lists. And also nationally, in, in every country, we also have our own essential medicines list, right? So in addition to the WHO one, you know, every country also, so in Ghana here, we also have our essential medicines list, you know, which is a, a list based on diseases that are endemic to the region, right? And so here you will find a lot of lobbying goes, because if you have one, one disease, you can have about three or four different drugs that can effectively combat it, right? And these drugs will be made by different companies, right? And so who gets on the list, you can see that there will be some politics in there. You know, so the science is one, and also you have a lobbying and the politics taking place on the side. You know? Thank you, Noble. Um, yeah. So there's just a new question in the chat, which is from Elango, who thanks you for your great presentation. And his first question is, where can we read your work? Because you recommended a lot of books, but where can, can we read something from you? Oh, oh yeah, I'm, I'm working on that right now. Um, so I'm working on publishing. So a lot of this um, I started doing because of my master's dissertation. Um, so it's what I looked into local production. I'm currently trying to work it out into an article that can be published, should have to be made available because as, as it is right now, the thesis is in a much more, written a much more academic way, you know, so for a paper out of paper audience is something I'm working on right now. Um, so yeah, I think I'll say my ideas are still forming slowly and um, when I'm able to come up with a very good uh, manuscript, uh, I would gladly make it available. You know. Yeah. yeah. Looking forward to it. So the, Thank quest you. the question from Elango continued, oh. and I just read it out loud. Um, in Basel, at the headquarters of pharmaceutical companies such as Novartis and Roche, MultiWatch has action days under the title Health is Not a Commodity. Uh, MultiWatch is an NGO here in Switzerland. And we, so MultiWatch, are interested in networking with activists and groups from Africa. Would you be interested? Which groups groups could we address? And do you have ideas for activities? Um, I didn't hear the last part. Can you take it again one more time? Uh -huh. And the last part was, um, well, they are interested in networking with activists and groups from Africa. And the question is, if you, you yourself are interested and which groups they could address and if you have ideas for activities for these action days in Basel at the headquarters of pharmaceutical companies. And then we can see what would that work? Can you say it again? Noble? I think the I'm saying that I can share my email address with Nicola so that Nicola can let um, the questioner have that email address and then we can start a communication from there. Perfect. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I can I can do that. That works. That works fine. Um, but also maybe um, on on that note, that note, if I if I um, might um, ask the question of you know of activism or maybe you know you, you mentioned a lot of companies in Switzerland, Noble. Um, what role, for example, can can people here in Switzerland play? Activists in Switzerland play to to kind of like force the, the kind of like the path that you 
presented of, of technology transfer or you know what role could we play here mm -hmm. yeah um yeah technology transfer is really key and you know um, switzerland is one of the most prosperous countries in the world simply because you have very strong manufacturing industries you know um, there's a very high level of value addition happens in, in Switzerland, right? So um, um, Swiss technology, Swiss scientific know-how, especially in pharmaceuticals, will go a long way to benefit, you know, um, um, to benefit countries on the continent. So, I mean, I was very excited about this Rush technology transfer program in, in HIV and AIDS, but, you know, as I read the case study further and realized that, you know, it did not, you know, yield its results, I was quite sad, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't too happy about that, you know, because that is something that we need, you know, so more of that, more of such programs, you know, that was initiated by Rush. Um, so how, how we can make that happen? I think, you know, in, in our own small ways, you know, writing articles here and there, you know, I mean, sending petitions here and there, you know, setting up meetings with the people that matter, you know, in these companies, if, it's, a, it's a, a, an activism organization or group, you know, you, you set up a project, you have them, you have them in Switzerland, and then you are in Switzerland, so maybe you set up a meeting with a few of them, you go in there, you highlight some of the problems, and, you know, they will tell you, okay, maybe we tried this in the past, um, um, it didn't work, you know, um, so this is probably how we can, we can try you know, um, some point there to request for a meeting and to just get an understanding as to what is going on and how you can collaborate will be the way to go, you know. Um, so, so, yeah, I think you are best place to do that because you have those the headquarters there. So, you know, maybe with together we can come up with a plan of action, you know, by me highlighting, we coming up with a list of strategies that we can we can we can um, touch upon and then you take this list or you take um, the outcome of the, um, the meeting to uh, to talk to the relevant people in the company right so you just walk into the doors of the vitis and see if you can get an audience with someone you know who matters and then we can kick start a conversation for me i believe it always starts with the conversation you know maybe they are willing to do something like that but no one has approached them you know, to talk about it or to find ways in which we can make it happen. You know, so I think just simply sometimes requesting a meeting and, you know, seeing what the outcome would, would be, it can be a good first start, you know. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Noble. Um, are there um, more questions um, from anyone? Just, you know, feel free to answer them via the, or you know, ask the question via the chat, or you can also unmute yourself. I guess um, whatever suits you. Um, I think there is a question that came. There is one in the chat. Yeah, Luca, can you take it from here? So the question is: um, I would like to your, I would like to know your thoughts about the role of the herbal medicine industry in decolonizing yeah. pharmaceuticals on the continent. Uh, Ghana has recently developed the only herbal medicine department in the sub-region at the University of Ghana. We also have the Center for Plant Medicine Research and are seeing a crackdown against unregulated herbal medicines locally. Mm -hmm. Is this the beginning of a truly indigenous pharmaceutical industry? or a distraction from catching up to infrastructure and capacity of the West? Wow, that is fantastic. That is a really, really, really well thought out and detailed question. Yes, um, so two things. I think there is a future for herbal medicines, right? And I'll cite, I'll cite a few interesting case studies. So one actually also I wish I had, had reference this book, but I think the Chinese laboratory, you find that in this book, um, in jungle laboratories, in jungle laboratories, 
I, there was in this interesting case study, I think it's, it's a one of the um, birth control pills, right? Was actually discovered, you know, through, was actually discovered through research that was carried out, you know, in, 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 a, in some parts of South America, right? And these are herbal extracts, but then it ended up, okay, it ended up in laboratories in the global north. And the, the sites where the plants were extracted didn't get any of the profits, you know, didn't get any of the profits from this drug. Another case study I'll highlight also, which um, I'm currently reading, um, is from one of the one of Ghana's leading biochemists who passed away a few years ago. She was also inter um, interested in a very important research that treated some type of um, urinary, um, you know, tract disease, right? And also the the extracts come from herbal plants. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because for a long time we have neglected scientific research into our herbal medicines. Right, so there is a great potential there. So I don't think it's a distraction. It is not a distraction from catching up with what we call these allopathic drugs. You know, the ones that come from you know um, synthetic compounds. Right, it is not a distraction. What we need is that we have found anecdotally that these herbal drugs work in certain conditions. Right, but what we need is proper scientific research. So for example, that the drug worked for one or two people is not enough to make it into you know, a global, you know, so, I mean, to produce it in a large scale. You need randomized control trials. You need scientific research to identify what components of the drug is actually the effective cure. And also you need to do research into quality control, into dosage, into side effects and all of that. So it is a scientific knowledge that has to go into herbal medicines that is missing. That is the part that is missing, right? The scientific component that has to go into understanding herbal medicines, because I believe there is a lot that we can get out of herbal medicines, right? Because believe it or not, the majority of people, right, and what in there with this scientific arsenal, which is what this the, this biochemist you know was doing before she passed away is using her bio training in biochemistry to understand herbal treatments you know and she coined an interesting term she called it phytoceuticals Africa can become the site will be phytoceuticals, which is interesting if we channel this scientific know-how into making, um, you know, drugs from herbal medicine. So there's a great, you know, there is a great future for it. What we need is the scientific know-how. And also a very interesting um, observation by one of the Ghanaian philosophers, um, Kwesi Redu, was talking about how Africa he, he asked the question, why is Africa not the medical powerhouse of the world? That is because he, he recognized how indigenous, indigenous knowledge in herbal treatments, you know, it's really prevalent on the continent, but we haven't added the scientific component. That is how come we are still not a global power in medicine. You know, what is missing is the scientific know-how. If we bring that into medical research, if we bring the labs, if we bring that value addition component, that knowledge addition component, we can have, an, I mean, a huge impact, you know, um, in terms of herbal medicine. It's like, just like this book that I cited, Jungle Laboratories, it's worth looking at, you know, this is how, you know, this um, um, contraceptive was derived from herbal plants in somewhere in South America, you know, and it's now the commonly used contraceptive pill, right? And, and and none of the benefits went to you know, um, this South American country, but that shows you the potential. And we also have one very effective treatment that comes from herbal plants for um, prostate cancer here, also developed by Ghanaian biochemists, 
right, is really effective in, in treating. So what we need is the scientific know-how that should go into these drugs, and and we can give the world, uh, you know, phytoceuticals. So I don't think it's a distraction at all. I think what we have to invest in is understanding, you know, scientifically, you know, why they work, how they work, the, the dosage, the side effects, and so on, you know, and then we can we can give a good good gift to the world. That's what I think. Yeah. Thank you, Noble, for your answer, and also thank you for for this great question. Um, are there any more questions? We still have time, and uh, that's the platform to ask them. So just if you want, to write them in the chat, or um, you can talk to Noble directly now. All right, so so um, uh, oh, go for it. No if if uh, is interested, um, you can take up this book. So this is the biochemist, um, Professor Irama Adi. She recently passed away, but this is her autobiography. And in the chapter where she talks about her research, she cites some of these um, research into herbal medicines and why she got into you know the scientific study of herbal medicines. You know, and uh, I'll just read. Yeah, so one research that she said could be looked at. I'll uh, go to the first, the last chapter of that. Yeah. Um, I'll just I'll just read the last paragraph. You know, I think it will it will serve as an interesting um, um all right, in 1995, one of the postgraduate students in the department wanted to work under my supervision, but not on any of the herbs I was interested in at the time, but rather on a plant used for the treatment of urine retention caused by B9 prostatic hepatrophy, BPH. Most of us in Ghana know this disease as shamoba. It's, it's a guy word, you know, is one of our local dialects. So most of us in Ghana know this disease as Shamoba. Although I was neither working on, on anything close to this condition, nor on any plant similar to the one being proposed, I thought that this was an opportunity that I was not going to let slip through my fingers. Shamoba is a fairly common disease, which knows no color, race, geographical location, or socioeconomic status. It, is on, it, it only knows your sex. This, at the Center for Scientific Research into Plant Medicine at Mampong, Ekwapim, there were documented cases of people with this disease who used to wear catheters, done away with the catheters when they were put on the extract of this herb. The herb is a particular species of the genus Croton. With the knowledge that one, that one of the defects of in patients with BPH is excessive conversion of the male hormone testosterone to a product known as dihydrotestosterone. <laughs> DHT, I believe of a head that is about to DHT. I think that this inhibition contributes to the plant's effective curative cure, and I am excited about these results. However, I did not have the resources to continue the work because the method I used was quite expensive, and therefore I had to suspend the project for lack of funds when the students got enough results to write up their thesis. I sincerely hope that someone will help go back to these investigations, with, which, can, which can definitely lead to a solution for this worldwide problem, Shamoba, right? So here is an example. Here is an example of, you know, um, a herbal plant that she was working on that she had to abandon, right? And so there is great potential in herbal medicines. You know, what we need 
is to marshal the scientific know-how, you know, to get into understanding this. So this is her autobiography and the chapter on research. She talks about um, the drug. But the other book is Django Laboratories. Um, I'll try to see if, um, I think the title is Django Laboratories, you know, which talks about the, the contraceptive that was developed from herbal plants um, in, in, the, in South America. So yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot again, Noble, for your um, very insightful talk, for answering all the questions. Um, there were no questions just before. Um, so if there are no, no questions left, I think we can come to, to a closing for, for your talk for this event. Um, thank you so, so much for, um, for being here, for sharing um, your research with us, um, all the book recommendations, everything. It was extremely insightful. Um, also to follow up on, on the topics you, you touched on. I think if um, you have um, any questions again or want to get in touch as well, you can uh, reach out to us uh, from the Tour de Lorraine. Um, you get an email um, uh, with, with the link um, for this meeting um, and there is an email address. So if you have any follow-up questions, um, let us know. Uh, we can also put you in, in touch with Noble um, if you know you want to follow up on something. Also, a quick note, um, this meeting was recorded. Um, so if you don't wish to be seen on any recording um, online or anywhere, also write an email to us. Um, we make sure that your name or anything like that won't be won't be on there. Um, so don't worry. Um, also, I'm sorry for that. Sometimes the connection was not too good, um, but um, it was only um, a few times. So I think there wasn't um, um, a big problem. Thank you so much, Noble, and thank you a lot um, for the translation, uh, Karin and Oscar, for. Um, Translating uh, the talk uh, was great that you could do that for us. Um, thank you so, so much for translating. Um, that's also a very important part of activism, making sure we understand each other and can connect. Um, so thank you um, for that. Um, thank you all for, for being here. Um, uh, it was amazing, a very interesting talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, make sure that you check out the program um, that is still on for a, for a whole not, for a whole week. Um, there are some workshops today that you can follow up on if you want to, um, very interesting ones. Um, so if you're interested in, in one of the topics, um, Luca put the link in the chat, you can see what you're interested in and yeah, make sure you check it out. Um, yeah, so I'll end with a big, big thank you to everyone, especially Noble and the translators for this amazing, amazing talk. Um, thanks and hopefully see you soon. <laughs>